Good evening and welcome uh, to our audience joining us from the UK as well as from all over the world uh, to, to what is the first in a unique series of events where we will be in conversation with the notable alumni of the University of West London. Uh, a few announcements to our audience before we uh, kick off. Um, the, this interview is on the record, so that means that uh, this is being uh, recorded. Uh, and also reminding our audience that your camera and mic functions have been disabled for this event, and that is to actually uh, enable the smooth running of this event. Um, and, the, and, if, and questions are most welcome. And if you do have any questions, please feel free to post them on the Q&A function uh, on Zoom. Uh, that is a Q&A function, not the chat function, if you have any questions. Um, and, uh, and, and please uh, keep your questions coming through. Uh, this evening, we have the great pleasure of speaking with Ian Carter, uh, who is joining us uh, from uh, Miami, Florida in the United States. Uh, Ian, is, uh, Ian is an alumnus of the university and a longtime friend of UWL. Uh, he graduated in 1984 with a degree in business administration. Uh, and he's been a great friend of the university ever since, supporting us in many, many ways. Uh, so in, in fact, some of you in the audience uh, may have benefited from the Ian Carter Scholarship or may know someone who has benefited from his scholarship program. Uh, and if you have uh, visited the university uh, uh, and, and taken a tour of the library, you would no doubt uh, be aware of the Ian Carter Room. And some of you who are students or, or recent graduates may well have had lessons uh, in the Ian Carter Room. And in addition to the tangible support that Ian has been providing us, uh, he has, he's also very generous with his time and he's joining us uh, from, from Miami of uh, giving up uh, some of his valuable time today. So this is a very good case in point. So Ian, we are very grateful for all you have done and continue to do to support the university and we are very glad to have you here today. Thank you, Suresh, it's a pleasure. I should also mention that Ian is an honorary doctor of the university. He received an honorary doctorate uh, in business from the university. Uh, so I should in fact introduce you as Dr. Ian Carter. Shouldn't I? <laughs> no one has ever done that, Suresh, so uh, you're in good company. We'll be the first. Um, <laughs> Ian is a highly experienced business executive um, and a corporate leader. He's the chairman of the Watches of Switzerland Group PLC, a highly reputed company that is listed in the London Stock Exchange. This is an appointment he took up very recently, in, in a few months ago, in November of 2020, if I'm, if I'm right, Ian. Uh, before that, he had an exemplary career uh, with uh, Hilton International, where he served as the chief executive, uh, and then moving on to being the president, and, and he was also president of the global development at Hilton Worldwide. So Ian is a true exemplar of that global executive with tremendous international experience. And once again, Ian, thank you for joining us, and very glad to have you here. Great to be here, yeah, thanks. Ian, if I can, if, if I can begin with your present role as chairman of the board at the Watchers of Swiston Group PLC, what would you say are the main highlights of your term in office thus far? Thank you, and uh, hi to everybody, and thanks for those that are dialing in at some unusual or ungodly hour. Uh, I, I know there's a few dialing in from outside the UK. I'm very lucky. This it's only two o'clock in the afternoon here in Miami, but nice to speak to, or at least uh, have the opportunity to, to speak to uh, those of you that have dialed in. Um, well, so, Suresh, you know, I have I've had an interesting career, as you as you mentioned, and. If you've had a chance to look at it, you'll see that there's the, the one common theme is that there's no real common theme uh, in terms of my career. But I did spend quite a bit of time on the boards of other companies whilst I was in my time, uh, you know, as an executive at Hilton. And that, that was um, extremely helpful for me and for the company in terms of being able to broaden our thinking and also, you know, experience some of the things that other companies were going through. So for 12 years, I was on the board of Burberry 
And that gave me the opportunity to, to do a number of things, but in particular to understand the Asian consumer in the luxury segment, because uh, approximately one third of all purchases in luxury segmented consumer products are derived from Asian uh, consumers, either in Asia or Asian traveling consumers. So for us, it was really important to understand that, that segment, you know, and, and that, that goes back more than a decade from when I started on the board of Burberry. I also then chaired a high-end restaurant company here in the US, which gave me exposure to another segment of business, but also a common theme being the luxury consumer. And so I'd always um, had an idea that, you know, once I decided to stop doing a full-time executive role, I would try and use some of the experiences that I'd gained over the years to give back to other companies that were maybe requiring those kinds of experiences. So in answer to your question, everything that went before me joining the board of Watches of Switzerland was in some way culminating in the notion of joining a luxury retailer of luxury watches. And in fact, um, for those that don't know, Watches of Switzerland Group is the oldest partner of Rolex worldwide, for example. Um, you know, Rolex is over 100 years old and so are we. We also own Mappin and Webb, um, you know, which is well known as the, you know, the royal jeweler. Uh, we own Goldsmiths and we own a, a number of other um, stores, a big, big one here in the US called Mayers. So um, for me, it was kind of like a, a, an obvious um, and really interesting opportunity to join a company like Watches of Switzerland, which was newly IPO a couple of years ago um, from private equity into the public markets. The biggest at what it does and growing. Uh, very important high brand relationships, uh, all of which I've experienced during my career at some point. And so as I've joined the company, the, the real highlights for me have been to understand you know, what makes the company tick. I'm a non-executive director, for, so everybody understands that means there's a, there's a CEO that runs the company today to day. And I am, you know, the chairman of the board. So I run the board and, and you know, obviously have a relationship with shareholders and the, the public markets, but the CEO runs the company. And um, I've got to know the company, got to know the team, got to know the people. Obviously haven't been able to travel a huge amount. I've been across in the UK, um, you know, for board meetings and the opportunity to tour some of the stores, um, but, but spent a lot more time kind of understanding the US business. And I, I would say everything that I hoped for when I joined the company has come true. Now I have joined the company in that it's a fabulous growth business, which really understands luxury retail and, and is, is poised for further growth. So, uh, you know, so far, so good, I would say. And, and, and before coming on to uh, so Watches of System, you, you spent quite a bit of time in, with Hilton. Yeah. I just want to just curious as to how that time uh, in, in, in that sector has actually enabled you to gain relevant experience and relevant insights that you're able to transfer to the other sectors that, you, that you've been involved in. Yeah. Well, first, I, first off, I would say the hospitality sector generally is a fabulous industry to be involved in for anyone who's dialing in that's, you know, either in or contemplating a career in that industry. Um, you know, what we've experienced in the last 18 months has been, you know, devastating on many levels, but it, it, it doesn't, in my view, change the long term perspective and opportunity that, that lays ahead for hospitality generally. And I experienced that, you know, firsthand when I became CEO of Hilton International, which was, you know, 17 years ago. Uh, at that time, the, the business I joined, uh, you know, it was, it was growing, but not at a, a great pace. Um, long story short, I, I, uh, we, we took the company private um, right around the time of the Great Recession, you know, the great economic crash, 2008, 2009. So our timing wasn't great at that point, but in many other ways, it was good because it, you know, under the private ownership, we were able to do a lot of things quickly, which, you know, we weren't reporting public results, etc. So we were able to move fast on a bunch of things. So. I, the, the highlight really for me during that period was that we went from being 
you know, a company that had about 2,500 hotels around the world in 80 or 90, about 85 countries at that time. By the time I stepped down at the end of last year, and, you know, we've been public by that time by about another three, four years or so, the company was more than twice the size it was when, when you know, a number of us had joined. Uh, we had a footprint of greater than 6,000 hotels uh, in north of 120 countries with a pipeline that would take us into another 30 countries, employed, you know, close to directly and indirectly through the franchise system, almost half a million people worldwide, and um, had never experienced growth like that in the history of the company, and the company is just over 100 years old, you know, so... I, I was lucky in that I was there in a period of, albeit kind of economic turmoil at the start, incredible growth uh, for the last 10 years. And, you know, it was just pleasing to see brands that were so successful in the US come to Europe. You know, they've become kind of mainstays of, of the hospitality business in Europe, you know, Doubletree by Hilton, Hampton Inn, Hilton Garden Inn, to name a few. In European countries as well as across in Asia now there are you know there's including those that are open and the pipeline there are 300 Hampton Inns in China now um, and that's a you know really eponymous um, American brand so I was there at a really great period of, of time for hospitality generally and Hilton in you know in particular so I, I love my time there and, and have lots of friends in that business I think it's got a fantastic future to it you know, it's, it's tough right now, but you can already see things returning to normal in inverted commas. You know, here in Miami and in South Florida, we're almost, you know, I was at, at one of our hotel, uh, my old hotels um, on Saturday and it was full, full occupancy, great rates, restaurants were full. I was in Manhattan last week and it's beginning to return to normal. So, you know, it's going to take a little while, but you, you think about the long term metrics of this industry with you know, increasing wealth in countries that, you know, will, will have a propensity to travel. You know, the Chinese traveler is a big traveler. It's becoming wealthier as a country. People will travel more. And so demographics work in the favor of, of the industry. And I think it will be, you know, a fabulous future mid to long term. Ian, Ian I'm sure that uh, many, many in our audience are, Quite curious as to um, your early life, and 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 is is would you have imagined this when you were back in school or, or college? <laughs> there was a lot of things I was doing in school, but I can't repeat them in you know in, in, in polite company, especially when I was at college there in, in Ealing. But no, I, I honestly I didn't see myself being in hospitality specifically. Um, I did always foresee at some point during my career, I'd move into services away from industrial products. You know, I, I, I spent the bulk of my career before GE, uh, before Hilton rather, with General Electric, who at the time I was there was the largest, you know, largest company in the world by market cap. Um, so it was bigger than, I mean, country, companies like Microsoft and uh, Amazon and Google didn't exist at that time. But they, you know, GE was a massive conglomerate and, and I, I love my time there and I love my time at Black & Decker in consumer products, but you could see I was gradually moving from industrial to consumer to service. And, and frankly, you know, I love the service industry and still do, whether it's been in hotels or restaurants or, you know, as it is now with, with uh, the Watches of Switzerland group, um, I, I really enjoyed that, that part of business, but I didn't foresee it, uh, you know, it just got there. Now, well, one thing I read uh, in your in one of your earlier interviews to the university uh, newsletter uh, is, and, and I quote, uh, "My time there uh, set me up for the rest of my life and helped me shape and helped shaped me both academically and personally." I, I, I think this is a very interesting statement, both for students, graduates, and also the faculty. I think we're very keen to know how how that um, experience you had at this university um, led to or helped shape you for the rest of your career. 
Yeah, look, it's easy with, you know, hindsight to look back and, you know, show so some, some degree of wisdom. There really wasn't much wisdom at the time. But what I can say is, I, I do believe, and I see this now with my daughter who went to university in, in Dallas at, uh, at SMU, um, you know, you, you get out of university what you put into it. And I mean that both academically and socially, right? You, you know, you can go to school, as we say in America, you can go to school and, you know, pass through and come out the other end and, you know, great, you know, be happy if you've done not much more than you needed to do. But the more you put in, the more you tend to get out. And I, I, I saw that certainly academically. I mean, you know, I'm not the top of the class. You know, I got a 2-1, uh, which I don't know whether it's still described that way. That basically means you're reasonably bright, but you didn't put in too much effort. I, I, uh, I think I think this, this still two two one is still considered a tremendous outcome. Yes. Oh, is it? Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, the first was always going to be something I was never going to achieve. So the two one was the, the the best I could have got. You know, that was the way I looked at it. But I I I really enjoyed you know the whole environment. I mean, I I didn't want to be in central London. You know, I love being in West London. It's simple as that. You know, I wanted to participate in sport, but I didn't want to have to spend, you know, an hour on a bus getting to the sports ground. Uh, you know, and I played soccer for for the school for for Ealing. Um, you know, the 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 student union was important then, and I enjoyed being an active kind of member of that. And, you know, I have friends. I mean, I genuinely mean this, and some of them, you know, actually life turns out in a funny way right but two of the two of the people i went to to ealing with live within an hour of me here in miami one lives in jupiter and one lives in palm beach so we have you know we've stayed in touch all of these years um and get together you know maybe once a year we speak regularly we spread all over the world i have to say i don't know if that's indicative of all the other years that graduated before or afterwards but you know i have friends you know from 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 the college that are in australia and new zealand in canada here one in germany one in switzerland one in ireland and we stay in touch so i i think what i meant by stating that was that i got a lot out of it as you would expect ac academically i mean that's kind of as you would expect you know we put in what we got out but we also made friendships that last have lasted and um you know, we, we, we became more rounded, I think, as people because of the nature of the school being, you know, one of good diversity of culture, background, ethnicity. All of those things were at play at those days, even if it wasn't explicit to us. It was actually, it turns out it was implicit and it was and it was really positive as, a, as an experience for me. And, and Ian, certainly, uh, you know, uh, with your, from your business background, but also from your personal background, you're someone who has this tremendous international perspective. Uh, I mean, uh, I, mean um, I mean, I have a question from Tony Chan, uh, who's curious to know from you, uh, how big a role does the Chinese consumer play uh, in, 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 in with, with the watches of Switzerland? So it's, it's really interesting. If I step back just away from Watches of Switzerland for a moment, I mentioned this stat, and I think it still holds true because it's one that I learned when I was on the board of Burberry, that you know, the, the Chinese consumer is hugely important generally in any luxury product. So if you take Louis Vuitton, you know, Gucci, any of the, any of the LVMH brands or the caring brands, you know, Cartier, or any of the watch brands, on the average, the Asian consumer, which is in part now largely dominated by China and Japan, more so China now than Japan, it used to be the reverse, is, is about one third of all the purchases in those categories, either made within Asia itself, so that's largely China or, or, or um, in Japan, to a little lesser extent, Singapore, uh, or when they travel to any other international destination. So if you extrapolate that then and then and dig a bit deeper and say, how would that affect say London? The percentages are about the same when the Asian traveler comes to London, it's about a third. Now it varies considerably and last year has been a complete anomaly because there's been no international travelers essentially in London for a year. But if you were to take London and Paris and say, you know, 2019, how, how impactful would it have been? then you could say on the average, somewhere probably between 25 and 30% of the purchases in the luxury segment 
in those cities would have been in some way influenced or going back to Chinese, uh, sorry, Asian consumers, you probably wouldn't be far wrong. So in a normal year, um, the, the Asian traveler into the UK generally is very important for watches of Switzerland group. Um, but we don't rely on it nearly as much as we do European travelers within Europe and of course, of course UK regional purchases because you know we own, as I mentioned, the Goldsmiths brand, which is you know throughout the UK in um, in many of the tertiary cities, as as well as you know some of the major watches of Switzerland stores and the Mapping and Web stores, which are predominantly in London. Uh, it's a little, it's it's somewhat similar in the US, but you know the US is really when you, you think about international travel, the US is dominated by the West Coast, East Coast. There's not an awful lot happens in the middle. In other words, international travelers tend to go to New York and Florida or California. Uh, there's not a huge amount in between other than the business international traveler. So, but again, the, the Asian traveler is hugely important generally and is growing in importance as the region gets wealthier. And, 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 and Asia is fast becoming, uh, or has been becoming, has been a large market for luxury retail since, since the late 90s, if I, if I remember correctly. But yeah. uh, if, if I can take you back, um, uh, Ian, because you, know, you, you, you are now uh, in the luxury goods market, before that you were in the uh, hospitality and the tourism industry, but when, when we look back at your early career after university, uh, it's, 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 been, it's been different industries, hasn't it? I mean, you've had your career ladder, career success being built in various industries. I think one of the things that we are sort of interested in is how those experiences and the multitude of a variety of experiences actually actually led you, to, uh, led you towards this direction. Yeah. Well, I, I, you know, I think, as I, I you know, facetiously said it at the start, you know, the common theme of my career has been there's no common theme. That's not quite right, you know, and probably the advice I can give for anybody who's, you know, willing to listen to it, but I don't necessarily say you should take it, just, just this is what's happened with me, is that the thing that was probably most useful for me was the, the, the idea of being flexible. Now, if I think back to my parents and my father in particular, who had a long career in business, he actually had been with two companies his entire life. You know, I've been with, you know, a handful of, you know, well-known kind of world-class brands, but I suggest in the future, it, it, it's you, those of you entering the job market soon, or if not, you're already in there, you're going to be more like me or even more extreme than me and less, less like my father or my mother, in that you're probably going to move a number of times. You're not necessarily going to be the same business or the same industry. And I say that because I think businesses and skills are becoming portable. One thing that COVID has shown us is that remote working is possible. It's not necessarily always desirable, but it is possible. Um, and this will be maybe some combo of that moving forward. Um, but you know, the, the one thing I found that was really helpful for me was I was very open minded about, you know, what kind of things I was prepared and interested to do that could add to my skill set. I mean, I didn't set out in life saying I'm going to be the CEO of Hilton International. I mean, I, 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 you know, be, it'd be dumb of me not to say I was always interested in progressing and, you know, becoming more successful and getting bigger and bigger jobs. But I didn't have that particular goal in mind. What I did have in mind was two things. I wanted to work internationally. And this is not for everyone, I, I, I appreciate that. But I, I genuinely wanted to work in different countries. Didn't want to just visit them, I wanted to live in them. And I have done, I've lived in five or six countries. Um, and I wanted to experience more than one function or more than one industry. And you know, having that kind of mindset does mean that you might be open to things that aren't necessarily obvious, but become very helpful to you in terms of shaping your skill set. And sometimes it doesn't mean necessarily accepting a bigger job. It could be accepting a lateral move in order to be able to gain that experience. And I think that's probably the single, you know, single most important thing I've learned over this time that, I, you know, from leaving college and working in GE and Black & Decker and then hospitality and, and now 
you know, sitting on the boards of different companies um, and advising, you know, some companies, you know, it's, that's the bit that's really kind of pulled it all together and been able, able for me to be able to give some experiences back and help other companies that are, you know, developing. And with, uh, with such significant roles and great responsibilities and also the time and, the, uh, and, and, and other pressures, how did you um, manage your work-life balance? How did you um, mm -hmm. um, match your, per, you know, your, your time off, your, your personal life with the stresses of the job? Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it re, that's the million dollar question, Suresh. And I, I don't have a great right answer for you because, um, you know, we, we even at Hilton, we, we introduced a program called Thrive to try and help people, uh, help people, facilitate people achieving that balance. And some of it is, you know, it's inbuilt. You may have a personal drive that says you don't want to switch off, even though, you know, you should switch off a bit or you switch off at, you know, odd times doing things that are not necessarily obvious to other people. I found that, you know, the, the most incredible invention for me and the most terrible invention for me was this, because it meant I was connected, you know, in a 24 hour industry, I was connected 24 hours a day, you know? So if, if we had an issue in, you know, I'm, I'm making this up. Well, actually, this is true. But we had an issue in Sri Lanka one time at one of our hotels, and it was 3 a.m. for me in the U.S. You know, I get a phone call and say, "You need to be aware of this in case it hits the press." It's difficult to switch off, is what I'm getting to. But I think what you do do is you try and um, ensure that there are things that are um, relaxing to you that allow you to recharge. Now, in some cases, that might sound odd, but I found. This opportunity I had, for example, to sit on the board of Burberry was a mental release for me as well, because it meant I wasn't thinking about hotels, but I was channeling some energy into something else. And it helped me kind of, you know, recharge when I went back to the hotel business. I do think it's important to get personal time. I mean, there are things, I, you know, when I was a lot younger, I was still playing a lot of sport. Now I do exercise, you know, because I have to, not because I, you know, trying to stay super fit. But I do like, for example, I like boats. So I'm, you know, I try and get out in the water as much as I can and, and just take time to literally forget and you know, um, you know, rewind as it were. So, but it's really not easy. I mean, I know people, we talk about it a lot and, and there are even companies now, as I mentioned, that, that try and actually help you, which in a way is kind of an oxymoron in itself, right? There's a company telling you how to relax. Um, but it's, it's difficult. Each individual has to, to, to figure out what's right for them. What I have found, and I can say this with all honesty over the last you know, 20 years, companies, the, the best companies recognize that, you know, nine to five is no longer, you know, the sensible option. You know, I don't care when people come into work or leave work. All I care about is do we get things done? And are we doing it in the right way? And are people happy? And are we doing the best we can, you know, against the strategy we've employed? And if that means they take Friday and Saturday and Sunday off, I don't care. You know, let's just just make sure we're getting done what we need to get done. And you have a high degree of trust in people. We've got people working remotely. You know, I, I learned that very quickly when I had teams that were global. You know, I had many, many people working outside of even the same time zone that I was in. So you. You know, you devolve trust, you, you allow people to, to do what they need to do to get the job done and just make sure that, you know, you've got the resources employed in the right way. And I think that's kind of a, a, a way of also allowing people to figure out their own time, you know, and, and work-life balance. Speaking of stress, um, Ian, I have to ask you this. COVID, mm. uh, lockdown, business uncertainty, I mean, in the UK, uh, the, you know, we put uh, we we put off the full opening for another month. Um, I mean, businesses are going through a you know tremendous period of uh, change and having to adjust. And I know for you know in, in the business school, as far as business students are concerned, we teach them that change is the norm. You got to innovate. You got to adapt. You got to overcome. But what are your views about how businesses should be adapting to COVID? You know, it's, it's interesting. It, um, first of all, I would say COVID, you know, in, in many ways has been transformational and, and devastating for lots of reasons, right? And it's big and it's global. 
But, but many businesses have a version of this kind of disruption through their lifetime. And it might happen every you know, 10 years. So if you think back to the economic crash of eight, nine, I'm not going to compare it directly because, you know, it, it's not the same in terms of the health issues, but in terms of impact on business, the crash in eight, nine, for those that were around and reckon, remember it, the, the impact on the stock market was actually bigger than, than COVID has been. Yeah. Um, so businesses, you know, good businesses plan for what they know will happen, you know, and good businesses plan for what they think could happen. And this is a could happen. Now, I don't think anyone predicted it would be as devastating as it is. Um, and you couldn't predict or plan for the massive, you know, negative outcome across the board in all these businesses because so many people were left, you know, without jobs for a period of time. But to think, the, I'll give you a specific example as relates to the Watches of Switzerland group. Our team were extremely nimble and adapted to the fact that it effectively our retail outlets you know, were shut for half a year, effectively. So we, we pivoted to online and spent a ton of money, time and effort moving to online. And you know, ironically, even during this horrible period we've been through, um, savings generally, not to, not, this is not to minimize what's happened to certain areas of the economy, but savings generally in the US, as, a, as an example, have never been higher. Yeah. I know it sounds crazy, but they're at their highest level now for decades. So there's a huge amount of, of propensity to be able to go and spend on consumer goods in just the US, just to use that example. And if you're able to move quickly or your business model actually was um, able to operate within these constraints that we've seen for the last 18 months, best example being Amazon, you know, which has thrived during this entire period because everybody said, oh, well, I'll just get everything delivered to home. Yeah. But even our business in Watches Switzerland, we were nimble enough to pivot and say, let's, let's focus online, really improve the website, you know, make it easy for people to buy online, you know, do some real clever photography so people can you know, see what a watch might look like on their wrist and all these sorts of things. So I'm not, I, you know, I, again, it's, there's no easy answer to this, but I think what you'll see in, in this last horrible 18 months that we've been through is that some companies have actually done rather well because they've been quick and nimble. They've had some things to their advantage. I think there'll be some underlying impacts that are, you know, long, they, they have life to them and, and they will have changed the way businesses operate and people work much like 9-11 did, you know, in terms of security at airports, you know, which changed the way we travel forever. Uh, but we've adapted to it, right? You know, we, we, we've changed, you know, now it's, it, it's more difficult necessarily to get through a, a security at an airport, but you get your ticket way quicker than ever, ever you used to because you get it all on your phone. Yeah. So there's the, you know, it puts pressure on people to do things smarter, different, et cetera. I think the, one of the underlying differences, though, is that people are, companies are reflecting on how we do business. You know, does, do we need to make our team members trek an hour into the office to spend eight hours in the office and then trek an hour back every day? Question mark. You know, it's a rhetorical question. I think we're, we're rightly reviewing that and saying, maybe we don't. Maybe that time is better spent at home. It's more productive. It's better for the individual, but maybe we should get together in the office twice a week, but not five days, you know, that kind of thing. So I think one of the outputs of this horrible period we've been through is it will have an impact on work patterns in certain businesses. Ian, I'm getting quite a few questions from our audience. And just, uh, just a reminder to, the, uh, to everyone watching, I can see a number of you have joined us now. Uh, if you do have any questions, please use the Q&A chat to post those questions and keep the questions coming. I have a, a couple of questions, one from Joseph, one from Moses, and that relates directly to what you were just talking about. And Joseph is curious as to, with the growing uh, AI, artificial intelligence and automation, you know, how do you see uh, the impact on the service industries? And also Moses is also uh, talking about the advancement in technology, and he's very curious to know, how that advancement in technology uh, is impacting on the luxury uh, retail uh, sector, uh, especially with regard to a company like uh, Swiss, uh, Watches of Switzerland. Yeah. 
Well, let me take it kind of in its broadest context. I think, you know, AI or um, any electronic measures to increase productivity, where it makes sense, and I'll explain what I mean by that, can be a good thing. Uh, so let me explain. I think if I think back to the way, you know, I just gave the example, we used to book airline tickets, right? I can't imagine ever going back to a paper driven ticket environment for airlines, you know, paperless environment, the productivity efficiency that brought so that I download my ticket to my phone and I simply scan that when I get to the airport. That was a massive improvement, both in, you know, the customer experience, the productivity of the airline, and therefore the cost benefit was fabulous. That was a great example of that. If you extrapolate that then to the hospitality industry where we've been, you know, relatively slow to pick up on all things technology, you know, more recently there's been a focus on it and keyless entry, you know, so you can get your key downloaded to your phone and you have IRFD, you know, entrance at, at the door that the, the keys that have been adapted to be able to again use your phone to enter the room. That's a good thing. I think generally that's a good thing. It, because it, but it, where I mean it's important that the technology is beneficial is that if you do this in isolation without talking to the guest, what we might think is smart, the guest might say, yeah, but I don't want it. Mm. And what I mean by that is um, the, it, it's, it's about understanding what the guests in a hotel might want the technology for. So if I'm a business traveler, and I've done this a thousand times in my life, and I arrive in City X at 11 p.m. and at 7 a.m. the next morning, I've got a breakfast meeting, I really just want to get to my room. So if I've got my key on here and I need to do nothing but just walk in, get in the elevator, go to my room, that for me is a big plus. Uh, the opposite argument, however, is if I'm with my family and I'm going to a resort in Spain, and I want to know all about the amenities at the hotel and when I can book the kids club or a spa or whatever it may be, I want the personal interaction. So there, you know, it's a very different proposition. And it, the, the, the key to the technology, the benefit, benefits of technology there are really understanding the purpose and the guest needs. And that applies to, I think, any service industry. You know, some, some things that we can do are highly productive and very useful and, and everybody benefits from it. Others, you have to understand the personal touch is actually the reason that the, the guest may be coming to the hotel or might be coming into the watch showroom. I think when it comes to products, and I certainly categorize watches in that, is that ultimately a, a purchase of a watch is a tactile you know, experience. You, you, most people will do the research online and then will come in and want to literally feel the weight of the watch, look at the watch, see how it feels on the wrist. And you can't substitute for that. So the in-store experience and the training of the team members and the quality of the training and, and their enthusiasm, et cetera, is massively important and can't be substituted by AI in my experience. Mm -hmm. And then the third piece I would look at is the whole area of CRM, you know, and the use of customer information to drive really good um, customer service. That's also really important because I'm sure we've all experienced, you know, really good customer service, which ultimately has probably been driven by data, you know, and the collection of data to so understanding that, you know, I and cards are like, you know, when I go to a hotel, you know, I'm going to drink fizzy water rather than, you know, carbonated water rather than flat water. Great, it's in my room when I arrive. So someone's thought about it, that, I, that's a good experience. What I don't like is getting 10 emails saying that there's an offer on something X, you know, it's 10% off this week. I couldn't care less. That then annoys me. So I'm probably no different than any other consumer in that respect. It's actually understanding where any kind of technical information, data or systems can be used in a beneficial way for me as an individual in a certain situation. And that makes it hugely complex. It's easy to do any one of those things, but it's not easy to say, okay, when Ian Carter travels on business, he actually doesn't want to talk to anyone, he wants to get in his room. But when Ian Carter is with family, it's actually very different. 
And I think hotels, it's a huge opportunity, but it's not easy as an example. In the retail environment, it's the same. Typically, um, the, the only benefit, of course, is you've got, a, you've got a physical product that people generally want to see, but understanding the guest and the customer requirement is hugely important. So understanding that whole, the way the CRM collection of information yeah. can work is really important as well. Speaking of Ian Carter on the move, uh, whether for business or for other other reasons, and certainly speaking of Ian Carter booking a hotel, I got I got a very interesting question from one of mm. us, uh, from one, one of our uh, audience. Um, has working in the hospitality sector made you more picky when you stay at hotels? <laughs> um, you know, it's funny. You, it's probably you know, like any one of us that's got an interest in any particular area. You, you tend to look at stuff even when you you know you think you've switched off. So I, I tend to go in a hotel and I'll I'll actually literally watch what the general manager is doing. I won't necessarily say anything, but if I'm sitting having dinner, I'll be watching. You know what people are doing, because I'm kind of interested to see who does what and who does it well and who needs some help and this sort of thing. Um, it, it probably has made me more picky, actually. You know, I, I, I'm probably not easy to admit it, but it probably has because, you know, almost um, implicitly now, I'm, I'm thinking about what a particular hotel might be and the experience I, I uh, will receive. One of the things I made a point of when I was, you know, in all my time at Hilton is that I didn't exclusively stay at Hilton hotels. I mean, I made a point of specifically staying at other branded properties, not necessarily, so they wouldn't know who I was. Uh, you know, we'd all, I'd also always, always book it, um, you know, without, without making it obvious who I was. So I could go and experience other hotels, either hotels we were interested in ourselves, you know, and understanding how they were performing or our competitors. And I would do that at least once a month. Uh, Ian, Ian we, we, we have a global audience today, uh, and one, one of the questions coming out uh, from, uh, uh, from, from, from Agatha is, have you ever thought about uh, Africa as a market in the luxury, luxury retail? Yeah, I mean, interestingly, we thought less so about luxury retail, and I said that only because, you know, from a, from a Watches of Switzerland perspective, we haven't looked at that yet. We're looking at other regions, but not yet. Africa. Uh, in hotels, absolutely. I mean, Africa is an, an incredible continent, first of all. I mean, you know, it's it's hugely populate, populated. It's, you know, many, I think it's 58 countries from memory. I can't remember the exact number, but it's a lot of countries in, are, are in Africa. It's, it's close to 58, I think. Um, but it's, it's also one that's interestingly highly concentrated when it comes to, you know, the potential for luxury travelers. And therefore, I think by extension, luxury retail. You know, you've got countries that have grown in wealth, you know, like Nigeria based on the petroleum um, um, natural resources it has. And, you know, then you've got some that are naturally have a strong propensity for the luxury traveler, like, you know, Kenya, Botswana from a safari perspective. And then, you know, South Africa, of course, which is in terms of industrial development, you know, more advanced. And then you've got North Africa, you know, Algeria, Morocco, Tunis, you know, Egypt, where there are a lot more of both, you know, luxury travel, strong connections back to Europe, you know, not necessarily for always the best reasons, but, you know, you think of the, the old um, colonial history of, of some of the countries, particularly with France and the UK, you've got strong connections, both from a business and a tourism perspective. Um, but they're pockets, they're not, you know, across the entire continent. And so selectively, I think what you've seen is um, a lot of developments in the kind of areas I've mentioned. I mean, one of Hilton, I'll give you an example, one of Hilton's oldest hotels, one of its grand dams, as they call it, is, is in, um, in Nigeria. You know, it's been there for, I can't remember exactly, I'm going to get it wrong, but let's say 30 plus years. And it's a, you know, it's a mainstay and, and has become, you know, one of the classic Hiltons because of the, the petroleum business that was always there. You had many international travelers there. And so there's strong ties into the continent. It's tended to, in a number of countries, you know, be cyclical, you know, growth spurts, then problem, then growth spurts. And 
you know, but, but overall, I would say Africa is hugely important long term. And the reason I say that is that, you know, one, you know, not particularly well known statistic, but one of the larger in, inward investors into Africa in primary products, you know, uh, base, ba, ba, you know uh, raw material products um, is China. And they're building large infrastructure projects, including roads. Um, and, you know, when you see that, you know, you, sh you should think, okay, that's an alarm bell in that if China thinks this is important, it probably is. And so you've got lots of, um, I would say, kind of um, regional geographic investment and development around the coasts of Africa. Uh, and I think there will be more to come from a tourism perspective, not just purely a business perspective, but it's a little bit like Brazil in that it's a long-term play. It's not, you know, it's not all suddenly happening right now. It's a longer term play, but it will be important. And, and Ian, one more, one, I mean, I'm getting a lot of questions from our audience. I'm going to keep it coming. Um, just thinking back to your own um, career experience and especially that early part of your career, um, but also maybe the latter part, um, you know, have you done anything, and this comes from Rianne, have you done a role where you have, you haven't felt confident in, but has helped you pull through? <laughs> this is going to sound odd, but pretty much every role, you know, at some point, especially at the start, I'm, I'm not a, um, you know, if someone says to me, you know, they got in the job and it was easy and they just, you know, they felt confident from day one. I'm maybe just me, but I'm skeptical because I've never felt that way. I, I, you know, any job that I've done when I've gone in, I've always felt a little bit overwhelmed. I mean, I may not let it show, but um, it, it, I think that's part of actually getting into a new role. You probably should feel stretched. You should feel a little bit overwhelmed. You should, should feel, you know, not 100% confident that you've got it all right, but you should be 100% confident in your ability to get it right. Um, so, you know, it might sound odd, but I've probably felt that at, every point in every role at some point in my career. Thank you, thank you, Ian. Um, I'm, I'm also getting questions from um, whom I'm assuming to be uh, aspiring uh, entrepreneurs in the hospitality sector. So I'm gonna put this to you. And it comes from Tony. Uh, and it's, it's, it's about the rise of uh, boutique hotels, service apartments and Airbnbs. Uh, based on your experience in hospitality and how do you see the competition from Airbnbs, boutique hotels, service, uh, service apartments uh, to, on the development of the hotel and hospitality sector? Look, you know, I would say general statement, you know, competition is good. And, and, I, and that's easy to say, but well, let me tell you why I think that's the case. I think good competition raises the quality of offering for the for the consumer in any industry right i'd rather there be more than less as a consumer myself um, i think airbnb in certain areas has been an unfair competitor me meaning they weren't they don't face the same legislative or tax constraints in some regions of the world that the hospitality industry does generally. So if you put that to one side and say, you know, okay, let, that, that'll get figured out. So it's a fair playing field, a level playing field for everyone. Then I would say, hey, great, competition is good. Because I think cho what choice, what, what it does is it, it, it emphasizes the reason you might choose one type of accommodation versus another. And then once you've made that decision, which brand you may go with, depending upon you know why you're using it. So let me explain. Um, you know, I would choose a hotel every time because I, what I want to ensure is very simply, and this is not to, to say anything else. This doesn't exist anywhere else, but this is why I make the choice. I want safety, security, and I want to know that it's everything. I'm you know the hotel is insured, and it's you know if anything goes wrong, I know who I'm dealing with. Right. And by definition, the big brands have to have that. You know, you, you, there's, there's no big brands that are going to ever run the risk of not having a fully safe and secure and insured hotel. 
should anything ever go wrong, you know, if that unfortunate thing should arise. So that's why I, you know, think that there's always room for competition and Airbnb has effectively caused hotel companies to redouble their effort to make sure they do what they do really well. So, you know, great in that respect. Then once you've made the decision as I would do in with hotel, staying in a hotel, um, it's, it, you've got a myriad of choice. You've got international brands and you've got local brands and then you've got individual city brands, you know, a, a hotel that may be family owned in a particular city. And I'm a strong believer of, you know, the choice is good in that respect as well, because not every trip is for the same reason as we discussed earlier. And sometimes I might want to stay in a big convention hotel because I'm at a convention. And other times I might want to be in a 70 room boutique hotel because I just want to be right in the center of the art district in Miami, you know, in Wynwood. Um, interestingly, um, the large hotel companies, and obviously I can just point to Hilton specifically, recognize that also and, and have introduced in the last five, 10 years, we've introduced collections. So we have the, the hard brands, you know, Waldorf, Conrad, Hilton, Doubletree, et cetera. But then we have collections, LXR, which is luxury hotels, Curio, which are by definition smaller hotels, but in the, uh, in the you know, four star segment. And, and then Tapestry, which is you know, three star hotels, but not running at hard brands. And therefore, each one of those collection properties can include, should an owner want to, a boutique hotel in those segments. And that's recognition that not all travelers, you know, want the same formulaic approach. Many people do. Many people want that absolute consistency. There's a reason why there are more than 2000 Hampton Inns in America, and it's the most successful single hotel brand in the world is because people do want that consistency. People you know, like the consistency of McDonald's. They love the consistency of a Hampton and you can stay in one in Minnesota or Marietta and it will be the same. And it's a great execution, very well done. And that's the reason it is, you know, in the super brands, power brands, it's the, the, the number one hotel brand consistently. So I think there's a, again, it goes back to your reason for travel. I'm exactly that person. I would stay in a Hampton if I needed to. I might stay in a big Hilton if I'm at a convention. And I love to stay in a little boutique hotel when I'm in Manhattan. And so I think there's room for all of them. That's the good news. Um, it, and, and generally speaking, um, the, the introduction of Airbnb in no way slowed the growth of, again, I can just speak to Hilton, the growth of Hilton. We, the Hilton still grew at you know, north of 6% every year in terms of rooms it added around the world. And so that nets out to nearly 50,000 rooms a year it's adding around the world. Airbnb didn't make a dent on that at all. It just added to the options that you know, people have and more and more people are traveling. So. Uh, Ian, uh, that also uh, kind of touches on uh, uh, another question I just received. But that question comes with a with a comment. Normally, we don't read out comments in this uh, interviews, but I have to read this one out to uh, out to you because this comes from uh, one of your scholars. Uh, she's a uh, her name is Christina. Oh. She is an Ian Carter scholar. Ooh. she's joining us this evening, and she says thank you for your scholarship that you give to students of the University of West London of which I am one of the students that uh, that was awarded your scholarship. Many thanks. So I just want to leave that comment. Great. You. Well, um, thank you for that and, and good luck. <laughs> I hope it helped. I, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure it did. And, and, and I know Christina uh, firsthand. So I, and, uh, and she, she's been a brilliant student. Oh, good. Uh, and I'm sure she has benefited a lot from for, from your scholarship. Now right. she asks, uh, she asks specifically about lockdown. What if we were to go into another lockdown. What yeah, advice look, I, you would know, you give hotels and the luxury goods sector about how to see through that period, how to survive in that period? You know, I haven't given it a huge amount of thought because I honestly don't think a full lockdown will ever will happen again. Not not related to COVID anyway, because I think. Um, I mean, look, I'm, no, I'm certainly not a medical person, but I, I, 
I think that from a medical perspective, we've got our arms around COVID, even the variants. It doesn't mean to say there couldn't be some more spikes and dips. You know, I, I think that would happen, could happen. But a full lockdown is unlikely because I think we've learned a huge amount about what worked and didn't work in the last uh, 12, 18 months. I'll give you an example. I live in, you know, most, not all the year, but a lot, large part of the year I live in Florida. 20 million people, we didn't do a full lockdown at all. We did partial lockdowns and we did some restrictive, um, put some restrictive measures in that you would know about, you know, like 25% inside dining, you know, masks at all times, et cetera, but we didn't do a full lockdown. California, 40 million people, it did. Economically, Florida is way ahead of California now. Now I'm not saying it's, you know, entirely down to, the strategy that, that our governor employed here versus you know the governor in California. Some of this is probably down to the weather because we have a you know we're outside all the time, 20, 365 days here in Florida. However, what we learned was that there are absolutely vulnerable sectors of our communities. You know, that at that at the first out we knew it was you know older citizens with underlying conditions, but we didn't differentiate a huge amount, we just went blank. I think what we've learned it. So the example I'm trying to give you here is that even with future spikes, I think we're smart enough to know what we can do to adapt without having to shut down completely. Um, I hope that's the case. I, I mean, I, I'd like to, to believe that's the case because I think we've seen enough in the US at least where I'm you know, living firsthand to say that there are certain things that we would absolutely have to do. But there are other things that we did that actually didn't make any difference. You know, it, we, we could have continued to dine outside carefully and, you know, use our masks uh, when we were in close proximity. You know, we could easily move back to continuing to keep the supermarkets open, but, you know, allow only, as we did in my local one, um, you know, uh, Whole Foods here, where they only allowed 100 people in the store at a time. You know, they moved to that very quickly rather than having, you know, lockdowns and things. So... I hope we will never be faced with that again, at least as relates to COVID. Um, but, you know, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if there's further constraints, just like you said at the start, Suresh, with, you know, the, 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 the delayed reopening in the, uh, sorry, the delayed Freedom Day in the UK. Um, you know, I think everyone is very mindful that things aren't totally under control and, uh, you know, we need to still be very careful. But, you know, what's really encouraging is that the vaccine rates uh, and certainly amongst the most vulnerable. And I respect people that, you know, don't necessarily want to take the vaccine, but those that are most vulnerable and those that could, you know, want to travel a lot like me, you know, I was vaccinated. I had my second vaccine three months ago. So I've been able to travel, you know, um, you know, like normal essentially. And, and I think that's really helped. We, we went from being terrible in the U S to really advanced uh, as people picked up, quickly on, on vaccination you know it, it almost adds a third dimension to uh to to to, to business uh, the consumer the supply and the vaccine so uh, yeah there we go. i mean uh, one thing i would say as well suresh is and, and and you we all may experience this i'm beginning to see it more and more now is that there's a there's a lot of catch-up to happen as we start to emerge from this and what i mean by that is I was talking to a friend of mine, um, you know, who's building a, a new um, showroom and the, just the FF&E, the furniture that's going into it is now delayed eight months because the factories are just starting up and they've got huge backlogs. Yeah. So the impact of COVID literally on our supply chains is going to be, you know, it's going to be at least another year, irrespective of we're all back at work or not. So. There's ripple effects to, to what's happened to the supply chain and all, all industries. Uh, but on the positive side, as we come back, I suspect there will be an awful lot of opportunity from an employment perspective as well, because everything has been so depressed, suddenly there's going to be this big release of consumer spending potentially, and you know we're back off again. Uh, with that, Ian, uh, I think it brings us to a close. Uh, well, because we are, uh, this is the end of our time this evening. Uh, to the audience watching us uh, today, uh, uh, we were in conversation with Ian Carter, Chairman of the Watches of Switzerland and alumnus of the University. Uh, a, a great big thank you for Ian to, uh, for, for sparing his time to be 
uh, talking to us and giving us a, a tremendous insight into several things. I think we touched on a number of themes uh, ranging from the luxury retail uh, to global expansion to your uh, experience in building your career success and also the, and serving as an inspiration to our students and our graduates. Uh, also, a great big thank you to the UWL event team, uh, events team for hosting this event online. Uh, and 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 and, uh, and and a great thank you to our uh, team from the alumni office, uh, Marcus and Nicola. Thank you so much. Uh, this has been a great event that you've organized and put together. And uh, certainly, our audience joining from the rest of, from all over the world has benefited from this. And also, thank you to you, the audience, uh, for, for, for 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 whom I hope this event has been uh, has been useful. And do join us for future events, and do keep your I uh, on on the emails and uh, newsletters you're getting from my alumni office. Uh, Ian, uh, this has been a special event, uh, not only because you are special and of course you are, but also this is the you you actually helped us launch the first in a series of uh, well, talks uh, in 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 what has been an ambition for the university alumni office for for some time now. So Ian, once good. again, thank you very much. Thank you. For a great having thank you and. Uh, have a pleasant afternoon in, 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 in Miami. Thanks, Suresh. It was a pleasure. Really enjoyed it. Good luck to, to all of you for the next one. And good luck for everyone that, that dialed in uh, for, for your futures. Hopefully some of you are in hospitality or in retail. Look forward to, to seeing how all things develop. But good luck to everyone. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks, Ian. And good Thank night. you. See you.